When migrating data off of an on-premise application, you often find that developers in the past have taken advantage of the ability to run queries across database instances or even use linked servers. Unfortunately, that functionality doesn't exist in SQL or Azure, but maybe there's a way around it. Let's mash on that. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the ASP.NET Monsters. In today's episode, we are going to take a look at Elastic Query, which is a mechanism allowing us to query between database instances on Azure. So I, I have here, and sorry, it's a little bit small. We couldn't figure out how to make this thing bigger. Um, I have two databases here on a test instance in Azure. Now, these are actually on the same server in Azure. Um, so the two databases on the same server, but a server in Azure isn't quite the same as a server in the real world and I guess the infrastructure world. So there's no kind of special permissions between databases on a server. It just it's just a container doubled a bunch of databases. Um, so I'm gonna set these databases up here. They're both kind of empty. So I'm gonna set one of them up here as a products database. Uh, so I'll just create a table and some products in there. So that is this database here. So the first one is going to be our products database. Uh, and then we're going to go and create an orders database in the second one. Uh, so, uh, so we just put a bunch of orders in here. So orders consists of orders and order line items. And then products over here in this different domain uh, consists of the name of the product and the ID of the product. Um, I probably messed up the the IDs as I just copied and pasted these, so we might have to select. Yeah, just have to go and update some IDs on the side and make sure that those are in sync. Uh, so I'm actually just gonna. Order line items. Just go reestablish that. All of a sudden, this just became like a crash course on things to run in production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just had these these IDs hard coded here, and I've got to just change them out a little bit. But I didn't put the right IDs in on the other side. I should have hard coded those as well. I do believe, if you're interested, that the Alt select and alt paste should work. Yeah, it should. It should. Look in this one. I was never sure. I guess I gotta select all the rows. Let's see. It works definitely in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Yeah, I was worried that it would do that. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I guess it's it's somewhat better, right? Because I can just do this now. It's just painful in a different way. Yeah, so this this would work in Visual Studio Code because um, it's across multiple lines. It's a little bit smaller. Maybe Azure Data Studio. It probably would. I wish somebody had done a video on that and convinced me to use it. Mm -hmm. Say three weeks ago, when somebody did a video on that and convinced me to use it, and then I did nothing about it. <laughs> it required installing a whole other application, and that's very hard. Now we should just be able to insert these into the database. Oh no. Uh, oh, good. So I just. I think you're going to need to comment out those. those. Do it. Three, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought I. What did I delete then? I thought I deleted those. Hmm. All right. Delete. Good, now we're back to where we want to be. So I have orders in this database and I have products in the other database. And normally this is just fine, but what I'd really like to know is what did people order uh, as part of their order? So normally I would be able to do something like uh, select star from products 
and they just join that to the orders table. Um, but there's no products here. And then if I do test yes, which would be a syntax that you would normally be able to use here, um, I can't do that because it doesn't know about the other database, so it doesn't have the ability to kind of hop between databases. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up this elastic query inside of this database, and this can be done entirely um, inside the database without having to worry about going off to SQL Azure or anything like that. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to set up a bunch of credentials that allow us to connect to the other database. So right now I'm in the orders database, uh, and I would like to bring the products into this database. So the reason that I chose it this way around and not the other way around is that I feel like I'm going to have more orders than I have products. So it's probably better to have kind of more data locally um, and less data remotely, if that's the thing. Um, so now I just need to run off here and look up what the key is for this database. I think it is that. Uh, and the user is actually. So these are the credentials that are used to connect to the other database. Um, so we're inserting, oh, this already has a, a master key in it, so we don't need to do that first row. We just do these, the second one here. Um, so it looks like we're already good. That one. Uh, so this is just basically putting some encrypted credentials into this database so it knows how to connect to the other database. Uh, and then what we do is we're going to create an external data source in this database here. So we're going to create this new data source called product source, uh, and it's going to point at the other database. So this is the other database name. This is where it exists. So this is our kind of connection string information to it. And then we're going to give it the credentials to get us back to that database. So those are the credentials we already entered. Uh, this might already exist in this database. Let's see how it goes. Nope, there we go. Um, so this is hooked up an external data source, and now all we need to do is create a table definition inside of this database that matches the table definition in the other database. So if you remember what it looked like, uh, products has an ID and a name. So in this database, we can create something that looks very similar. Uh, we just have a unique identifier and a name. Uh, so the things that are different here is we don't specify kind of the, the constraints around this table because those are already reflected over here. Uh, so we're going to set up this new external table called products, and we'll execute that. Uh, so now if we come over and we take a look at these external tables here, there's going to be a products table here, and we can query this table as if it was a local table. So now we can go back and do our select star from products. Uh, and the first query just takes a second to run, assuming that I haven't messed up the credentials, which I might have. There we go. Um, so that's gone off. It's established the database connection, and it's logged in and run that query for us. Uh, and we can also uh, go ahead and join this table against other tables and treat it just as if it was a, a table that was local to this database. So we can go and join our tables together. And there we go. Uh, so we managed to get the name of the product from the products table. So this is still really small. I don't know how to make it bigger. Uh, and the quantity from the orders table. So this is how we, we managed to join these two things together. So if we wanted to expand on this, we could just like order ID as well. And there we go. So this is a pretty simple way of being able to hook up to other databases. So these can be uh, other databases on the same Azure SQL Server, or they can be on a different Azure SQL Server. Um, or I suppose you could probably even set it up so that it connected across uh, a greater distance on the network. Um, the only gotchas that I found with this one were that when I set up these databases initially, I forgot to allow the databases to connect to uh, Azure resources. So I was firewalled in doing it, even though I was mm -hmm. kind of conceptually on the same server. Um, the networking is such that these databases may be on completely different pieces of hardware, completely different parts of the data center. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. That's, that's interesting. I would have thought that the firewall wasn't an issue uh, since they're the same server. 
so to speak. Yeah, right? you would think that, but I, I imagine that there is probably some plumbing stuff going on in the background that it's actually transitioning my connection over to some other server somewhere else. Right. Um, I don't I don't think the concept of a server is an actual like physical thing in Azure. Right. I don't think it maps down to an actual VM and then to a piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. So cool. there was a little bit of, of plumbing there to do at the start in terms of after you had the tables defined, loading up the data, but basically you set up that master encryption, you added the credential to the store, set up the external table, mm -hmm. created a definition of the table in your, by creating a, a definition in the second database, and then you were able to do the query. Um, so what, what are the performance characteristics of this kind of join across the network? Uh, I mean, it's always going to be a little bit slower than having it inside the same database. And I have not tested this with a great deal of data, but the connection seems to be pretty slow the first time, and then it's much faster the subsequent times. So I think SQL is fairly smart in figuring out sort of the minimum amount of stuff that it needs to send back and forth between the two servers. But obviously, it's going to be like, it's going to be data implications to this. It is going to be slower than having everything on the same uh, database. But at the same time, uh, it allows you to partition your database so that you have different sections for different parts of your business and allow you to make changes. Um, I mean, kind of the reason that we don't like people to cross databases like this is that it makes it difficult to understand who is making changes to database structure. Like if I change the definition of the product table over here, and I change my primary ID to being an integer instead, like that has knock on effects in a whole other database that I didn't necessarily even know was connecting to this database. So that's kind of the reasoning behind we don't like integrating at the database layer. We're much happier to integrate in the API layer. Um, yeah, and there's other there are other patterns too. Like this is mm -hmm. fine for an interim smaller set of data, but I imagine if you're trying to do like a, a larger thing or a more routine thing like a sales report, you'd be best to do something off of like a CQRS pattern or something like that. We're actually building up a, a, an order history table or something that's been normalized or denormalized, I guess, and has the data that you're actually looking to report on. Yeah, this might even be something that you might want to explore, like putting in a data cube something like that, uh, exporting this data from sources and then rebuilding it in a denormalized form in some other database somewhere else. Uh, but in the meantime, this is definitely an approach that looks to me like it has some promise. Is that read only or can you write to that table as well? Um, I think, I, I tried inserting some records here and I think it was um, read only. But and I you, do, you, you have to add scarves. It's it is winter here, so yeah. Okay. So I don't just think true. it works in quite the same way. Um, yep. So I I don't know because I didn't see anything with documentation that said like this is read only. So I might have just set up something incorrectly, but probably not. Um, I think it is just a, a read only sort of thing. Cool. All right. Great. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on this episode of the ASP Net Monsters. Remember to like, comment, and share, and we will see everybody on the next episode. Cheers. Bye.